Dallas veterans report for training camp on July 25th at Marriott Residence in Oxnard as the Cowboys see if the many off-season changes in personnel can finally get them over the hump. We'll break down their roster and update the depth chart as we preview training camp for the Dallas Cowboys by going one-on-one with R.J. Ochoa from Blogging the Boys at SB Nation on the OFN Meeting Room with Greg DePalma. It's Tuesday, July 3rd, 2018. I'm Greg DePama. Thanks for tuning in to the OFN Meeting Room as we preview NFL training camps for the 2018 season. And we continue today with Dallas Cowboys writer at SB Nation for blogging the boys, RJ Ochoa. RJ, thanks for helping us talk Dallas Cowboys football. Anytime. Hope you guys are having a great week getting ready for the four. Yeah, everybody's just trying to keep a little bit cool. How about you? Are you in uh, Texas? I am in San Antonio, Texas, and so uh, we we hover, we kind of jump rope around 100 degrees this time of year. So <laughs> it is uh, it is comfortable. Okay, if you say so. Uh, let's talk about this uh, Cowboy team. First of all, how long have you been covering the Cowboys at SB Nation? Uh, with SB Nation, a little bit over a year now. So uh, it's uh, good times, good times indeed. And uh, overall, how long have you been uh, in the business and uh, been a Cowboy fan your whole life? I've been, definitely been a Cowboys fan my whole life, as far as in the business, uh, about three years now. So, uh, I, you know, and then that that short little time span, I've seen uh, I've seen some things. I've seen some things and could tell some stories. All right. Well, we're hoping that's the case. So let's get started. By the way, you take a look at the Cowboys uh, history here. And as I mentioned, uh, the trying to get over the hump. What I mean by that is, is even though they have won some playoff games uh, over the years, uh, since 1995 Super Bowl win, uh, they've only won three wild card games. That's it. So uh, it, it, they've been very mediocre to slightly above average at times. Uh, only three losing seasons in the last 15 years. Uh, what do you? What's what's the mood in in Dallas as far as the fans are concerned? I mean, again, it's nice to win, and, and as I said, they they've been winning. Only three losing seasons in 15 years is a good thing, but not, when it comes to the playoffs, it just hasn't happened. So, how does that feel, and and, and how do the fans take it? Well, you know, I think I think there's frustration certainly for anybody who uh, who hasn't won a title. I think you get that in all sports, and so I think people are are certainly tired. It doesn't help that. You know the the Cowboys organization is is chasing some some pretty serious ghosts. I mean, it, it has some pretty tall shadows, if you will, uh, with the teams that have accomplished what they have in the past, and they've obviously got links to those. I mean, Jason Garrett certainly knows uh, knows what that was like. But yeah, I mean, it, it's been a while. It's been a bit. I mean, there are people you know who hover around my age. I'm 28 years old. That you know. Uh, we're young. We're 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 very small. We're infants uh, during the '90s dynasty, and there are people that, that get a little uh, get a little frustrated by that. I, I think you know I've put it different ways before. It, it's you know you think about it. John Elway, when the Cowboys last won a Super Bowl, did not have a Super Bowl ring of any kind. You know, did not have one of any kind. He's True. Since won two as a player, went in the Hall of Fame, uh, has one as a general manager. The last time the Cowboys won a Super Bowl, Marvin Harrison was still in college. Uh, and since then, he's been drafted, played his whole NFL career, won a Super Bowl of his own, retired, sat out the mandated period, and was enshrined in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, the Cowboys, when they won their last Super Bowl, they'd won 5 of 30. Uh, they'd been to, it was their eighth Super Bowl, Super Bowl 30 at the time, the New England Patriots, uh, did not have a single one. They've since caught them. And so you think about it, the Cowboys, they had this, I mean, they've been in 8 of 30 Super Bowls. When you say it like that, it sounds just absurd. And um, and so for 22 years to go by and, and not another birth is, is frustrating. Yeah. Uh, how about the, the uh, power uh, situation? Uh, everybody, of course, uh, rightfully so. It's all about Jerry Jones. Uh, but Stephen Jones, uh, what do the fans take of Stephen Jones and, how, and what he's done uh, personnel-wise, uh, to tell you the truth, I mean, you look the last couple of years, there's just been a, a, a lot of new young uh, players on this team. And, and I got to tell you, I mean, the Cowboys had maybe my favorite draft. I mean, I really liked a lot of the players coming into the draft that the Cowboys wound up selecting that we'll get into in just a little bit. So 
Uh, how, how, what's the what, what's the deal with with Stephen Jones as far as the fans are concerned? Well, I think that I think there's this still misconception that Jerry is is pulling all the strings and it's what Jerry <laughs> says and, and you know people people love to beat that drum but uh-huh. it does seem like there is a, a larger balance of power you know versus the uh, hyperbolic nature that people have again the misconception they have and. And Steven, I think you can certainly attribute a lot of successes to him. I think the Cowboys have had some successes in the draft. I'd, I'd throw Will McClay's name in there, uh, okay. who's sort of the head man in there. Um, but but other than that, I mean, you know, they they they've sort of they've gone from almost one end of the spectrum it seems to the other. I mean, you know, you think about it, and everybody again associates Jerry as oh, you know, he'll go get that guy, he'll go pay him, he'll do whatever he can to go get that free agent. And it seems now that 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 Stephen perhaps may be scarred by those moves. That so, you know what we're just we're not going to do anything. We're just gonna, we're just going to sit, hold <laughs> tight, you know, and uh, and wait for the turn card to see what happens here. Because the Cowboys, I mean, it's hard, you know, to find the last sort of sexy name, if you will, that they went on a guy. I think the last guy of that quality was T.O. in terms of free agent. But the last move they really made that was just kind of a Jerry splash was when they traded for Roy Williams, the receiver. In 2008. Okay. Wow. That's yeah. That's been a long time. Uh, by the way, Will, Mc, uh, you, you talk about McClay, and he, uh, uh, when I was working long time ago uh, with the Florida Bobcats of the Arena Football League, he uh, had just taken over as the head coach. Jim Jensen was the first coach. And Jensen was uh, brought in as a coach uh, primarily because of his ties with the Dolphins uh, to sell tickets. Uh, but then um, uh, it was great. You know, he he t- he then took over for Jensen, and uh, and then I left the, the the team. The organization kind of disbanded. That's what it is. Uh, that's what it was like the early days of the Arena Football League. Anyway, fact is, is uh, years later, uh, when, when I heard that he was connected to the Cowboys, I was like, wow, that's awesome. That's great. That's, that's a great story because everybody, players and coaches, that, you know, they, they have to pay their dues sometimes, uh, whether it's the CFL or the Arena Football League. And it's nice to see that, uh, that good men actually you know, catch a break and get the opportunity. And it's, uh, and it's nice that you, you, know, you throw his name out there because obviously he's done a good job for the Cowboys. He really has, and he's uh, not somebody who a lot of people recognize. Again, just because it's easy to kind of say, oh, it's Jerry, whatever. Uh, but Will McClay has quite the eye for talent, and I think he's proven that with his last couple of drafts. All right, let's uh, start breaking down uh, the depth chart uh, on offense. And, again, a lot of changes this offseason. Uh, we'll start a quarterback, and uh, boy, it, 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 watching Cooper Rush play uh, in the pr- uh, preseason last season, it, it looked like, uh, hey, you know what? Maybe the Cowboys got themselves something there uh, as a future backup, long-term backup. Who knows? Maybe if they need him as a starter uh, for a short period of time. Uh, but that was uh, that's a player that opened my eyes last year. Had a long starting career, as you know, in the MAC, uh, and then they get Mike White this year. Uh, which is a very good pickup for the Cowboys, who actually looked very good in the Senior Bowl. Uh, see, I, I'm one of those uh, uh, people who believe that you just keep drafting quarterbacks every year if you can, even if you have one like Dak Prescott. And the Cowboys have added a couple of good uh, young quarterbacks to their roster. It would be something if Mike White turned out to be anything. And I agree with you. I mean, certainly come out of Western Kentucky, there's a lot of reason to believe in him. But the Cowboys, you think about it, they've had back-to-back seasons where they have found legitimate, viable quarterbacks as rookies. That's that's tough to do. I mean, they did it with Dak Prescott. It kind of gets forgotten almost, as crazy as it is. Yeah. And then Cooper Rush, as you mentioned. And so if they do it again with Mike White, I mean, you're talking three years in a row with that's legitimate right. play out of a rookie quarterback. That would be something special. I wrote something earlier this week, uh, or last week, I should say, about how Mike White does sort of present this potential domino. I mean, if Mike White is able to outplay Cooper Rush the way Cooper did Kellen Moore last season, who is now amazingly this position's coach uh, for the Cowboys. But if he is, I mean, you know, Mike White could earn somebody else a roster spot. I mean, we saw last uh, training camp, excuse me, last preseason period, that was when Cardale Jones got dealt. That was when Jacoby Brissett got dealt. Um, Maybe that's, you know, maybe Cooper Rush is kind of that guy. You know, I I mean, the Cowboys have carried through quarterbacks. They're not certainly somebody who is shy in terms of doing that. Okay. But uh, but Mike White could be that guy. I mean, you know, but, you know, as you mentioned, it's hard to to walk away 
from a young, cheap quarterback that you really like, and so maybe the Cowboys just kind of hold there. Yeah, and, and injuries happen, as we know, and it's such an important position. Uh, we just saw it with the Super Bowl champs. Uh, and, and, and what you got to do to make sure that you have a viable backup. Uh, regarding Prescott, uh, he had the big 2016. Things didn't work out for him last year. So what's the mood coming into this year? Uh, no Des Bryant. I'm not so sure that's going to be a major impact. Maybe the Jason Witten uh, retirement is just as much, uh, if not more of an impact for Prescott. But uh, what, what about that? What about Prescott now? Uh, and uh, the feelings regarding uh, the fact that he didn't have as productive as a 2016, uh, a 2017 as he did 2016. Why did that have to do it? No, no, uh, Elliot in the backfield for uh, some of those games. Sure, you know I think it's amazing and, and and an incredible bit of irony that sort of the moment that a lot of people turned on that was the Thanksgiving Day game against the Chargers last year. The Cowboys at the time uh, were entering. That game, having played quite poorly against Atlanta, that was the Chaz Green game, and then at home the next week against the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, that Sunday night fiasco when Jerry was uh, acknowledged for going to the Hall of Fame. And Cowboys just couldn't do anything offensively. In fact, the Cowboys, that three-game stretch, it was the first time in Dallas Cowboys franchise history that they scored in the single digits in three consecutive games. Wow. And you think about how many games the Cowboys organization has yeah. It's pretty – Pretty, uh, pretty sort of just eye-opening. And that was the game that a lot of people turned on, Dak. And okay. I always found it really ironic because Tony Romo was on the call. And, it, you know, you'd imagine that after watching Romo's career end the way Cowboys fans had to and sort of acknowledging perhaps too late as a general group that they didn't appreciate him when it really mattered, that people are so willing to turn on Dak so quickly and that it would happen with Romo sort of watching from above. Yeah, you could argue the greatest thing that's ever happened to Romo's career in, in terms of his legacy would be Dak struggling this, this most recent season because all that's done is, is add fuel to the fire that, oh, Tony could have done this. Tony, and, and when you couple that with what Tony was doing in the booth, how he was predicting things, you know, that, that's what all, all these sort of haters, if you will, were saying. Oh, Tony could have seen this coming. Dak can't see it. He's too young. He's, he's a young player, et cetera. <laughs> so, there are a sector of people who I think have grown impatient with Dak, and that's why this season is going to be big for him. You know, next off season he'll be eligible to negotiate a contract extension, and we know the going rate for franchise quarterbacks in the NFL. And so Dak is um, – I, I think Dak, so far, if you considered his season or his career sort of four quarters, I think the first three quarters were fantastic. The first half of last season was even really great, and then the second half of last season was obviously terrible. And so I think that overall right now the sample size is favorable, but we'll see what happens. And, and I think that there is this sort of sensation that Dak needs to put up or shut up because the Cowboys, uh, if they're going to commit financially, they have to make sure they're doing something they believe in. All right. Well, let's talk about the receivers because that's going to be huge for them. And I got to believe this is going to be a, 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 uh, a very important training camp and preseason to develop chemistry with all the new faces uh, but, you know, you got Williams and Beasley back, and that's about it. Uh, okay, you got some other uh, other players that were with the team last year, but no, 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 none of impact. So a lot of the new, a lot of the new impact players uh, got a lot of rookies, uh, you, you know, and free agents, of course. Uh, Gallup, I mean, I really like Gallup. I think Gallup's got potential to be a number one in this league. Uh, I, we'll see how things go for him in the preseason, how fast they can pick things up. You bring in uh, Thompson and Hearns in free agency. You trade for Austin. And as far as tight ends, as we, met, as we mentioned, Witten's gone. Uh, there's all this talk about Rico Gathers and can he, you know, we know talent-wise he might be the, the, the most talented guy in the group. Uh, and then you also bring in Schultz and Wells, a couple of very intriguing uh, no name type of tight ends that uh, actually could wind up making this team, especially Schultz. I like Schultz a lot, and I think you know playing that Stanford offense, they don't throw the ball much, but uh, I think he could be a better pass receiving tight end than people think. So, uh, a very intriguing group. Uh, Cedric Wilson's in there as well. Uh, talk about all the new faces and uh, and throwing even Rico gathers and 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 what you think could wind up what, what kind of what kind of uh, uh, rotation you could wind up seeing early on in the season uh, from what you've seen so far. Well, I'll say that I really like Michael Gallup as well. He really you know, I'm a big fan of, of Michael Thomas there in New Orleans, and he kind of reminds me of that just a little bit. Not to put too much pressure on his shoulders too quickly, but you know I don't think that Dak. 
I don't think anybody ever told Dak, hey, dude, you got to force the ball to Dez. You got to try this, Dez, Dez, Dez. I don't think there was any directive given to that degree. But I do think that there is this sort of psychological effect on you if you're that quarterback. And, and I remember when Tony Romo was a young player, uh, T.O. was obviously on his team. Not that Dez is, is that sort of player, but the, the point is that I think that there is this psychological thing, and I've always equated it to if I was on the same basketball team as LeBron James, I would never shoot because I, I would feel so stupid. I would feel ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. I, I, would, I, would, I would feel like I'm wasting this because LeBron is on my team. And so if I was Dak, I would feel sort of inclined, I guess is the right word, to throw the ball to Dez because, hey, I've got the franchise's all-time leader in receiving touchdowns on the field with me it makes sense to throw him the ball. So I think removing that psychological, you know, sort of roadblock, if you will, I think that maybe that helps. I think there's a lot of talent. These receivers, the Cowboys have this new group, the Cowboys, Sanjay Law, their new receivers coach. I think they're really focused on guys that get open, guys that are shifty, guys that win right at the line of scrimmage, guys that are able to create space because that's the kind of quarterback Dak is. Dak is a high percentage thrower. He's not going to take chances. He's not going to throw those 50-50 balls that Tony Romo was, was so good at. But, He's a guy who's going to maximize his opportunity, and I think that's that's a great way to play. And so I think the Cowboys have those type of receivers. At tight end, yeah, I mean, Jason Witten's retirement is certainly something that was a little jarring, and a lot of people have really started to believe that Witten had lost his step. He was slow, although to be fair, he was never fast. Yeah. Uh, but Jason Witten being gone is certainly a difficult thing to overcome, but I agree with you. I like Dalton Schultz a lot, and I agree. I mean, coming out of Stanford, that's a program that the Cowboys know well, but Rico Gathers is this guy – that people just will not let go of when it comes to hype. Rico <laughs> Gathers is, is, I mean, but but at the end of the day, Rico Gathers is, is so raw and doesn't understand the position. I would I would argue right now, if I had to predict a 53 man roster right now, Rico Gathers wouldn't make it. Just really? Because it doesn't it doesn't make sense. He, he's he's not a complete tight end. And, okay. You know, J, Jason Garrett has said that as recently as a few months ago, and I just don't see how that that bridge is. You know, that gap is bridged in the next, you know, two months before uh, before everything's final. Can he make the practice squad again? Uh, he could, I, I guess, but I just, I, I think at that point, you know, maybe you cut your losses if you're the Cowboys, you let somebody else kind of experiment with him. Okay. You know, Rico's also a guy who's, he's into his rap career, which is something he's been vocal about. All right. He had a, he had a moment on his own Instagram earlier this offseason where he said he barely plays football. So he's got a little bit of, of stuff that, you know, you're just kind of, Man, is, is this worth all the trouble? Uh, sometimes. I think he's a very talented player. But um, but I just I don't think he makes the 53 man roster. All right. And uh, and, and, by the, and what also is important with Schultz and, 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 as, and David Wells, too, is these guys can block. They both blocked for uh, major rushing programs. And I'm not talking... Uh, uh, you know, spread schemes, you know, gimmicky spread schemes. I'm talking, you know, line it up and power and block. And you talk about uh, the, the big-time rushers as it come out of San Diego State the last two seasons, including Penny this season. And we know what's going on at Stanford with McCaffrey and Love. Uh, that's a bonus, too, uh, to get I, – I, I tell you the truth, I wouldn't be surprised if Wells made the roster as well uh, either. No, I agree. And I totally agree that those are the types of players the Cowboys want. And they want that to be a strength of their tight end. And considering that is such a weakness of Rico Gathers' game, that's why it just the math doesn't make sense, okay. if that makes sense. Uh, wide receivers then, uh, Hearns. Uh, you see, I'm not a big Terrence Williams fan, I'll be honest with you. I just never – I just – I've given – to me, I've given him shots the first few years, and I just – every time I think he's going to turn the corner, to me he doesn't. So uh, I don't know and, – and, and because there does seem to be some pretty good depth on this roster – uh, I think it's time to see if whether it's an Alan Hearn staying healthy or again we talked about Gallup. I don't know what Tavon Austin can do. I've, I've never just been able to figure that out. Uh, maybe a new uh, coaching staff will figure out how to get him the ball more. Uh, so how do you think that's going to work out? Yeah, besides Gallup, who might be you know Gallup Hearns, you think those two guys could end up with a lot of reps? I think when the Cowboys start the season, I think Terrence Williams is still their primary wide receiver. I think that's just sort of the way they roll. Mm -hmm. I do think, though, that over time, over the course of the season, that Michael Gallup perhaps replaces him, kind of the way Terrence Williams did Miles Austin, you know, amazingly five years ago. Okay. And so it just it seems like that's sort of inevitable. 
but it does feel like at the beginning of the season, just because the financials of the situation yeah. don't make sense to, to cut Terrence Williams, it yeah. feels like that's where we're headed. Sure. No, I, I get that. And I fully expect Terrence Williams to be the starter as well early on. But, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think uh, I think as long as the, 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 the good group, man, if they, they do their job, uh, they'll be getting more reps. Okay, and of course, Beasley's there as the uh, security blanket. Offensive line, it's a good line. They add in uh, Williams. How did that what, – what happened there in the draft? Do you, do you believe that they wanted to go after uh, uh, Goddard and uh, the fallback was Connor Williams and uh, and then just moving on from that? I mean, Connor Williams is a heck of a talent to get in the second round. And uh, is, is, is it going to be his job uh, to win that left guard spot? I don't think the Cowboys had any interest in Dallas Goddard. I think okay. it, it made for I think it made for a cool moment uh, in NFL lore. The all way right. all of that materialized, but I think the Cowboys went into that saying, "Okay, we've got three picks in these first three rounds. We need a linebacker, we need a lineman, we need a wide receiver." And it'd be hard to find a combination that you like better in terms of practicality than Leighton Van Der Esch, Connor Williams, and Michael Gallup. I agree. And so I, I, I think the Cowboys, you know, you could argue they reached a little bit on linebacker at 19 with Leighton, but that was their top need. That was what they said, okay, we've got to come away with a guy. That's the spot that we're going to reach at. And so that's why Leighton Van Der Esch got the call. And then I think the Cowboys, you know, they were – they were willing to play with that second-round pick. Certainly, obviously, everyone's linked into the Seattle Seahawks and Earl Thomas, but Connor Williams lasting that entire first 49 picks was just too much uh, of a bargain to say no to. And so I think that was maybe the only thing that could convince them not to trade that pick for Earl Thomas. And so I think that that was the right way to go, and I think that Connor Williams is, is your day-one left guard. And playing between Travis Frederick and Tyron Smith, that's, you know, there are a lot harder ways to, to come into the NFL than that. And so I think Connor is set up to have a nice career as the, you know, the Cowboys, they've always offered this sort of 80% eliteness, if you will, along that offensive line. They've always kind of had one spot that was just a little bit of depth tape, you know, whether it was Doug Free, you know, Ron Leary kind of turned into maybe a little bit, you know, gorilla glue instead of depth tape, a little bit something more firmer. Uh, but I mean, you know, having Connor Williams there is certainly something impressive that I think the Cowboys offensive line is going to benefit from. Can Cameron Fleming win the right tackle job? I don't think so, because the Cowboys have invested in Lyle Collins. They believe in Lyle Collins. Lyle Collins, a lot of people think, played poorly last season. I'd say he played quite well at right tackle. He took on the AFC West, which is a difficult division in terms of pass rushers. And so I think Cam Fleming knew what he was signing up for. I think Cam Fleming knows he's this team's swing tackle. Okay. And that Tyron Smith has some some question marks at the very least when it comes to his health, um, which is uh, a, a great thing, a great tool to have, especially when we saw what Chaz Green did last season for the game. All right, let's go ahead and uh, hit the defensive side of the ball. And interesting because uh, in a couple of spots, defensive line and the secondary, to me it looks like there's a mixture of good depth and weak depth. And what I mean by that is on the defensive line, it looks like there's pretty good depth at defensive end on the outside. Not so sure on the inside. Uh, that's why, you know, they, they bring in Ward in the trade with the Raiders. Uh, but still, a lot of questions as far as the overall depth uh, behind the starters inside. But, uh, you know, with Lawrence, you know, we, we, he's developed into a you know, premier pass rusher. You got Crawford. Uh, you add in uh, the free agent Ely, who's a pretty decent player. Uh, and then uh, Taco Charlton, of course, maybe he's ready to take off your first round pick. And I'm a big Dorrance Armstrong guy. I mean, I really like what I saw out of him at Kansas. Uh, and uh, that's a terrible program. And I'm sure uh, it was hard for him to produce after a huge 2016. His stats didn't look like it last year. But, hey, I'm sure he was, you know, quadruple teamed. Let's just make sure the only good player on that roster ain't going to beat us. So uh, I like the depth at defensive end uh, as opposed to uh, the interior. Uh, and on the defensive line, that's very important to have all those edge rushers. I agree, and it felt like for so long the Cowboys had a sneaky line of depth along the middle of that defensive line, but it feels like that's been attacked this offseason. You know, Malik Collins breaks his foot. David Irving gets suspended for the first four games of the season. After that, you really you are just sort of kind of trying to figure things out and patch them as you go. I agree that Jihad Ward, that, that's kind of that's a Rod Marinelli move if I've ever seen one. He always finds that guy, whether it's Jason Hatcher or Henry Melton or Terrell McClain. There's just always that dude that Rod Marinelli is so good at making work for 16 games, and then he goes on and benefits uh, financially elsewhere. So Jihad Ward kind of feels like that guy. Demarcus Lawrence emerging really is such a beneficial thing for the Cowboys. 
obviously Tyrone Crawford, every year there's, there's the guy that Cowboys fans hate because he's overpaid. And for so long it was Brandon Clark. Now it is Tyrone Crawford. But you're right, after him, I mean, you're talking about your, your backup pass rushers is a, is a second-year first-round draft pick in Taco Charles. Yep. So I think you could be in a lot worse shape than that. You know, the Cowboys also brought in Coney Ely this offseason, uh, a guy who they've had their eye on ever since he came out. And so I, I agree, and they've got they've got other other little projects, other little sort of things planted, other small seeds. You know, Randy Gregory could come back. Nobody knows what's going to happen there. And if he comes back, all of a sudden you're a little bit more in business there. Obviously, the Cowboys also have Charles Tapper, who's a third-year former fourth-round draft pick, the other fourth-round pick from Dak Prescott's rookie year. And he's been a health question mark, and so he's working to get back. And so you, you kind of, you know, you, you threw out this net to go fishing, and right now we're reeling it back in and we're seeing what we get. Uh, because there are a lot of possibilities at this point. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, next linebacker. We mentioned Van Der Esch. Uh, he was a late bloomer, but I remember watching him even like around midseason. I forget which game it was. And I was like, wow, I love this guy. Uh, throwback. And at the time, really nobody knew who he was. I mean, he, he's, he, he had the injury uh, earlier in his career, and he was just he's your typical late bloomer. And uh, uh, but the, the type of player that you really want on your football team if you're a fan. Uh, and then uh, the whole uh, situation with Jalen Smith is going to be huge for the Cowboys. I get that. Sean Lee, got to keep him healthy. So the starters, talent-wise, look really good. The depth, though, there's a lot of change there, it looks like. Uh, you did uh, draft Covington. I am a huge Joel Lanning fan. I don't know exactly how he's going to fit into the team, but he's a football player. Loved him. Typical college football player that I love. Sometimes they don't make in the NFL, but I think Lanning will. Uh, so talk about that linebacking core because there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of changes from last season. Well, this is the appeal of the Cowboys, I think, potentially, because you consider what they were and, and specifically what they weren't when Sean Lee got hurt last season. And Sean Lee is magnificent. I think when healthy, Sean Lee is arguably the game's best linebacker, maybe second only to Luke Keekley. And, you know, but when he's gone, he's gone. And the Cowboys significantly regress when he's gone. And so they tried their best to hedge that bet with Leighton Vanderish, obviously, in the first round. You're right, Jalen Smith. Jalen Smith at this point is, is the joker in the deck. I mean, he could be wild. You, you have no idea. I, you know, personally, I want to believe so much that, that this is it, that last year was the year that he was kind of sort of assimilating back into the game of football. I think we can all understand that on a physical level. It's just uh, it's a hard thing to believe that that will ultimately really work. But if it does, then, hey, all of a sudden you're kind of cooking with gas, so to speak, if you've got Sean Lee, Leighton Van Der Esch, and Jalen Smith. And then, yeah, you got some depth. I think the Cowboys, though, you know, it, this is a very loose foundation. It's it's like it's not a house of cards quite, but it's it's a potentially great thing. But it's so loose because if one of these linchpins goes out, suddenly everything is a little bit broken. Sean Lee's injury prone. Leighton Vanderish is a rookie. Yep. Jalen Smith is, is a huge question mark. The Cowboys lost Anthony Hitchens in free agency, who filled in admirably last season. They've always kind of had that guy, whether it was Rolando McClain, whether it was Anthony Hitchens. They've got Damian Wilson, who's entering his, the final year of his rookie contract. They've always kind of had that guy, and, and I just I hope that losing that isn't, uh, isn't losing the, their best backup option because while they do have some amazing talent up top, after that it gets a little shallow quite quickly. All right, now the secondary, and uh, same thing to, f for me when I look at it, uh, as, as the way I, uh, I, I I looked at the defensive line, some good depth and some weak depth, and 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 I and I see that there is some good depth at safety. You know, when you have Byron Jones, Xavier Woods, uh, Frazier, Heath, uh, and, and there's also a couple of intriguing rookie free agents. Uh, but corner though, Lewis, Awuzi, Brown. Not sure what happens after that, especially if any of those guys get hurt. Maybe Byron Jones moves over to corner. Let's we'll start, we'll start off with Byron Jones. What, what is his better position, and, and what is how are the Cowboys looking at playing him? Well, so they did officially move him to corner this offseason. So they've, they've gone on you know, with that. It's been a move they've kind of contemplated and, and really sort of struggled and juggled his, uh, his rookie season in 2015. But, yeah, I mean, he'd been playing safety, and Chris Richard, the former Seattle Seahawks defensive coordinator, comes in, Cowboys secondary coach and passing in corner, says, hey, this guy's a cornerback. And Chris Richard said, you know, he always wanted to work with Byron Jones. I mean, I think everybody acknowledges that Byron is, is quite athletic. 
Uh, I interviewed Byron last week, and he talked about how he believes Chris Richard is that guy, the guy who's going to help him with his footwork and okay. his technique and, and really sort of getting himself right to be a cornerback in the National Football League. And they're, you know, similarly to the linebacker, there's so much talent. You know, you talk about, you obviously got Shidabe Awuzie, who I think people are really big on. And I think there's a little bit slept on on a national level. I think mm-hmm. Shido could be sort of the next great corner in the NFL. Byron Jones, Anthony Brown had a great year his rookie season, really dipped a little bit last year, got benched uh, there in and around December in the season. And then you got Jordan Lewis. I mean, so you got a lot of talent. It's just a little raw. I mean, because even Byron Jones is talented. And even as experienced as he is in the NFL, he's playing a new position. Yep, and yep. so hopefully, you know, the experience that comes with Chris Richard and everything he did with the Legion of Boom helps translate over here. But right now, in terms of the secondary, the biggest question mark is who's going to be that center fielder? Who's yeah. going to be that free safety? Is it going to be Xavier Woods? Are they going to flip a trade for you-know-who at some point? That's the lone question mark that everybody has, really not just about the secondary, but about the roster in general. Okay. Well, what do you think? What do you think is going to happen? I think, um, you know, I think we're in July. And I think, uh, <laughs> you know, th- th- this morning, in fact, this morning I wrote something at blogoftheboys.com. Um, I had a Twitter follower send something to me. Earl Thomas uh, likes to post on Instagram. Somebody, uh-huh. uh, somebody posted something on Instagram and said, Earl, come to Dallas. The Legion of Boom is, is over or dead or, or done or something like that. Just, uh-huh. oh, wait, what, what with the, the unofficial retirement of Cam Chancellor? And Earl Thomas liked it. Earl Thomas liked it. Uh, and so you can you can draw whatever conclusions you want, but I think it's it's apparent, it's, it's painfully obvious. It, it's it's a it's the fire alarm going off in the hotel you're staying at, and you're telling yourself, ah, it's cool, it's just a drill. I don't need to go down. That's how much Earl Thomas wants to play for the Cowboys. It just remains to be seen who's going to blink first in terms of price. Are the Cowboys going to raise their price? Are the Seahawks going to lower their price? Will the Cam Chancellor news affect how the Seahawks do business? Uh, but if a move is going to happen with training camp officially being this month, I mean, logic stands to reason that it would be soon. Yes. Uh, but but so many things have defied logic. This whole thing defies logic. This whole thing started because he ran down Jason Garrett in the locker room. So anything could happen. Okay. And as far as uh, compensation, what do you think it, it, it logically could end up being? I mean, do, do you have to give up a first-round draft pick next year and more? Well, I don't think so. I mean, I think... I mean, the Seahawks and Cowboys had flirted with that second-round price tag around the draft a few months ago. So okay. if it were me, if I were the Cowboys, I would tell myself, look, I was willing to part with this, this second-round pick this year. Why would I not be willing to part sure. with it next year? Yes. Um, and so that would be my, my line in the sand. So I would do it in an instant. Cowboys, Come on, second-round draft if, pick. Get them over I here. If, <laughs> if I was the Seahawks, I don't know why, they, if it's a 2019 second-round draft pick, considering all the talent they've lost, considering that they're probably not going to compete that much, considering that the Los Angeles Rams and San Francisco 49ers are likely going to be the kings of that division for a while, I think it cuts your losses, considering especially that Pete Carroll might be on, you know, closer to the end than he is at the beginning in their, with his time with the Seahawks. I think that that's, you know, the Seahawks aren't, aren't signing. Or it comes down to, would you rather have one year overall Thomas or a second, third round draft pick yes. next season? That, sure. That seems easy. Yeah, I mean, Seattle better feel really good about their chances this year to hold on to Earl Thomas. If if they're like, yeah, I really don't think this is a Super Bowl year. Uh, But if they think they can win a Super Bowl this year, then they probably hold on to him. I mean, I would if I thought I was going to win a Super Bowl. Uh, But that's, that's, you know, again, because, you know, the Cowboys can't be giving up the farm for him. You know, that's that's why I'm saying if 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 second round pick, that's that's more than doable. Uh, and even it, if I have to give up another be. player, too, even if I have to throw in a defensive back, you know, if, if Seattle needs somebody, you know, to compensate for the loss in the defensive backfield, fine. DB, second round pick, done. It's just one of those things, you know, I feel like like the Cowboys and, and Earl Thomas, you know, like we all go to the same high school, all of us, and we all know that they've got a crush on each other, you know, and, and we all know <laughs> it. And, and we've, you know, we've told each other, and we said, oh, did you see him in the cafeteria? You know, things like that. And it's just, you know, it's like watching it on a sitcom. It's like, do it already. Yeah. Do it. Get yeah. together. Just do it. We've been enough, you know. And so um, there's just too much to it that, it, you know, it's the, the Chris Richard angle is is just overwhelming. And so um, if it doesn't happen, it will feel a little dry. I won't lie. 
All right. Uh, by the way, uh, running backs, we skipped over that. Uh, I don't want to get too much into the Elliott thing because that's a broken record. We know if he's healthy, how good he could be. Uh, the question, though, I wanted to ask you about is the backup situation. You know that Rod Smith is there. Uh, you did trade. You brought a new fullback from Oakland. It seems like you're trading with Oakland like every day or something like that. I mean, how many trades can you make with one organization, one off season? But uh, what about the uh, the rookies, Scarborough and Chun, the rookie free agent, and then throw in any other rookie free agents on the team to keep an eye on? Well, so obviously you got Zeke, and then you got Rod Smith, and then yeah, Bo Scarborough is a guy who. I mean, you want to you want to love you, you do, and and certainly uh, feels like Marion Barber reincarnated to a degree, which I think everybody hopes. And uh, if he can be your guy that kind of puts the games on ice in the fourth quarter, like Marion was, I think you're you're doing all right for yourself. But after that, I mean, Tavon Austin, obviously, if you want to qualify him as a running back, there's sure. a guy uh, who the Cowboys also traded for, uh-huh. and uh, you know, and, and then Darius Jackson's a guy. When the Cowboys drafted Zeke two years ago, they also drafted Darius Jackson. Um, out of Eastern Michigan, I believe it was. Yeah, yeah. the Chippewa. And and so drafted him, and uh, and he was a guy that made the 53 man roster that they didn't want to lose. Held on to him all the way till December. Darren McFadden and Lance Dunbar came back, and they they waived him. And the Browns picked him up. You know, kind of he had a cup of coffee there. And then their new management this off season, he uh, he was let go from Cleveland. And so he's back with the Cowboys. He tore his ACL last year, uh, so he's healthy. He's another guy who I've talked to. He says he's feeling great. He says, you know, all this is kind of just lined up for him in his life. He's been through a long road in such a short time. And so Darius Jackson's another guy, but it's just such an uphill battle. because, yeah. And that's, that's, you know, when I when I talked about Mike White being a domino, Mike White could earn one of these guys the roster spot for all we know. But there's, there's just there's a lot of guys, and there's uh, there's only 53 roster spots. But if I had to, to kind of go with it right now, I'd say, I'd say Zeke, Rod Smith, Bo Scarborough, and then Tavon Austin as your sort of hybrid guy. Okay. And uh, by the way, as far as rookie free agents, and I think the Cowboys have a lot of intriguing ones. You know, I mentioned Lanning. You got Chun. Uh, Hearns, the linebacker. Uh, Kelly and Robinson in the, in, in, in the secondary. And David Wells, who we also mentioned. I think that's a pretty good list of rookie free agents. Any of them or anyone else that we didn't talk about that we should keep an eye on during camp? You know, you mentioned it. I mean, Kelly's a guy that a lot of people have a lot of high hopes for, but it's just this is such a young team, and that you know the Cowboys have had so much success with undrafted free agents. Obviously, Tony Romo, Miles Austin, Lucky Whitehead had a cup of coffee too with the Cowboys, and the Cowboys have just been they've been really good at finding those guys. Uh, but with such a young team, it's harder to have those guys make their roster because you've got so much young talent everywhere. And so yep. this isn't a, this isn't a year where I feel too confident in any of them. Unfortunately, okay. certainly practice squad candidates. Um, but uh, but I think the Cowboys, you know, they've they've got a lot of young guys. You know, I, I didn't even mention Noah Brown, the wide receiver. He made the fifty three man roster That's last true. year as a as a seventh round draft pick. I mean, there's just there's so many of those things, so many of those man. That that guy's going to be hard to cut. This guy and that guy, and so you get to fifty three awfully fast that way. Okay, and uh, the 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 uh, special teams, you know, Bailey and Jones. Uh, we know they're solid. Uh, who takes over for Switzer? Tavon Austin, I think. I think that's pretty, uh, pretty easy right there. Okay. He literally, literally took number ten off his back and put it on his. And so Tavon Austin, I think, is uh, is suddenly your return man. Rod Smith has worked back there as well, but I think Tavon Austin is the guy handling punt and kick return. All right, that was an easy one. All right, sounds good, uh, RJ. I appreciate it. Uh, again, we'll see. Uh, there's uh, got to be hope, though. This is definitely a team that has talent. You always want to stay away from the injuries, and if you could do that. Uh, there, there, there's a shot. I mean, I don't think there's any question. Cowboys have a shot to uh, be a playoff team this year, and who knows what else could happen if Dak Prescott has a really big season. So uh, it looks like it's going to be a lot of fun covering the team this year. And, I, and uh, thanks a lot for uh, helping us to preview training camp, and we look forward to talking to you again uh, throughout the season. Anytime. Really enjoyed it. And, uh, and yeah, I, I can guarantee one thing, and uh, whether that it's, a, it's a solid ride or a bad ride, it will be one hell of a ride. That's uh, the way the Cowboys roll. <laughs> Appreciate it, RJ. Thanks a lot. All right, that's RJ Ochoa <clears throat> joining us from Blogging the Boys at SB Nation here on the Our Lads Football Network. Now, we're going to have, uh, it's early in the day, on uh, July 3rd, uh, Independence Day Eve, we are going to have another OFN interview with Kansas City Chiefs uh, football writer Matt Connor. 
So that's coming up later today. And uh, we'll promote that interview tomorrow. I don't like promoting on social media uh, after, uh, you know, after like late afternoon. Like once you get past like 2 to 4 o'clock area, I like I save everything for the next day. But doesn't mean that these interviews aren't posted because they are. This one will be posted uh, in the next hour. Uh, we'll have the Kansas City Chief uh, interview posted today. We'll promote the Kansas City interview tomorrow, but we will promote this today, and that's why you want to follow us on Prime SN. That's my Twitter handle, and I always uh, send out the tweets to let you know when these interviews and all our shows are available on demand on the Our Lads Football Network at OurLads.com. Speaking of Our Lads, make sure if you haven't already done it, order a subscription of the NFL Draft Review Guide that's out right now. I just received mine in the mail yesterday. So uh, go ahead and get that. Order that at OurLads.com. And uh, make sure you uh, always are ordering subscriptions uh, at OurLads.com. And uh, you know what? If you haven't even ordered your draft guide, I know the draft's over, but this is still a good time to order the draft guide. I mean, get the dra- get, get ready for the draft next year, too. Uh, but uh, go to OurLads on the OurLads.com website and check it out. All right, that's it for this edition of the OFN Meeting Room with Greg DePalm on the OurLads Football Radio Network where it's never too early to think about the start of the 2018 football season. We'll see you next time.